The following is a briefing entitled California Policy Options to Accelerate Latino Student Success in Higher Education. It was conducted in the Rayburn House Office Building in Washington, D.C. on January 24, 2007. Sponsoring organizations were Excelencia in Education, the Tomas Rivera Policy Institute, California Policy Research Center, and the California Institute for Federal Policy Research. The running time is approximately one hour and a half. I guess it's a sign that there's a lot of interest in this particular topic, so we'll give it in that direction. I am Jim Ransdell, Executive Director of the California Institute for Federal Policy Research. Uh, we are based here in D.C. We keep track of as much of Washington as we can, which pertains significantly or more uniquely to California. Uh, the briefing uh, uh, today is sponsored by Valencia in Education, and the California Policy Research Seminar Center. Sorry, I apologize. Those are old, old, the old, the old, old habits die hard. Uh, what I will do is uh, get out of the way in a hurry because there's a fair amount of information that folks want to uh, cover here and uh, a lot to talk about on the topic. If any of you would like to uh, come in with questions and answers, and I suspect many of you will. Uh, I'll introduce our first speaker and we'll take two. Our first speaker is the uh, president of Excelencia in Education, Sarita E. Brown. Sarita has spent more than two decades in prominent national education institutions at the highest levels of government. Uh, she started her career at the University of Texas in Austin and uh, moved to Washington, uh, D.C. after spending some time at UT focusing on a national model promoting minority success and graduate education. Came to Washington to uh, be a uh, uh, the, uh, head of or the executive director of the White House Initiative for Educational Excellence for Hispanic Americans under President Clinton and uh, in the administration of the U.S. Education Secretary Richard Riley. She uh, uh, has been in the nonprofit sector for some time recently. She is founding president of Excelencia in Education. Uh, she uh, was founding president of the Hispanic Scholarship Fund. And uh, at Excelencia now is uh, uh, College of Fund Institute Research, research is here. Uh, <laughs> and uh, her current position uh, allows her to uh, focus on policies that uh, aim to uh, accelerate Latino success in higher education, making research policy and practice to serve Latino you know, students and institutions. <laughs> And uh, in addition, it's a pleasure to introduce uh, her as a good friend, Sorry, Ethan Brown. Thank you. I have to say, this is a glorious way to begin the new year at Excelencia in Education. We are a relative newcomer uh, in higher education and in national efforts. We were launched in 2004. If, you, if this is your introduction to us, then know that in the course of my comments and in the presentation today, we will be giving you information about who we are and what we do and how to follow up. Because really, we hope that today is the beginning of a discussion that will, for some of us, be a lifetime's calling, and for all of us, a national priority. Over the next 15 years, the United States will see a profound demographic shift as the baby boomer generation retires. As one of them, I can say, I know, I'm getting ready to hand it off. In California, this process has already begun. Following in their footsteps in the workplace and in leadership roles are today's young people, today's high school students and college students. Many of them are Latino. To ensure the high caliber of tomorrow's workforce and leadership in California and in the country, it is important to act today to address the educational achievement of our fastest growing community. In response to this challenge, Excellencia Education was launched in 2004 here in Washington, D.C. as a 501c3 with the aim of accelerating Latino achievement in higher education. Our strategy is to apply the results of research and analysis to public policy and institutional practice. This brief, which will be the focal point of today's discussion, California Policy Options to Accelerate Latino Student Success, is one example of our work. Good ideas need solid support. 
How many of you can think of the exquisite solution that never was implemented? We are enormously grateful that this good idea, meaning this project, secured the support of USA Funds through the Office of the Philanthropy and the direct involvement of Henry Fernandez, the Director of Scholarships and Philanthropy. Representing USA Funds in today's discussion, I would like to introduce to you Terry Muhlenberg, Senior Vice President for Government and Industry Relations. As she makes her way to the podium, not only does she represent USA Funds, but for some of you who have been on the Hill, these are familiar terrains. She worked for the state of Connecticut, and prior to that, worked with two Senate committees. This is an environment she knows well, and we welcome her to today's event. Short, but by way of background, USA Funds is a nonprofit corporation founded in 1960 to provide uh, post-secondary education, preparedness, access, and success. We're best known as being a guarantor of student loans. We're the largest guarantor nationally. Um, last year, we made it possible over $27 billion in funding to help students and parents pay for a college education and to help student loan borrowers manage their debt effectively. In addition to our role as a guarantor, USA Funds provides and supports a variety of other programs and initiatives that help students and families prepare and pay for college. Included in these efforts are programs that directly benefit Latino students. For example, our National Scholarship Program awarded nearly $8.2 million in renewable new based scholarships nationwide for the current academic year. And students who are members of ethnic minority groups receive priority consideration for these funds. We also have funded a number of initiatives, including the Spanish Language Early Awareness Program, designed to help more Latinos benefit from higher education. Uh, in addition, we've worked with Excellence on a couple of occasions and have supported research in the Institute of Higher Education Policy, Invest in America's Future, and also how Latinos pay for college. So we were delighted to work with Excellency in Education, the Tomas Rivera Policy Institute and the California Policy Research Center uh, on this report. We believe it offers a set of viable institutional and policy recommendations to enhance post-secondary access and success for California students, particularly Latinos. And we hope that this report will be for a greater focus in the policy arena to, on the critical educational issues facing Latino and other students and lead us toward exquisite solutions as to reach it. At the federal level, it is also our hope that policymakers will build on these recommendations by enhancing support for Pell Grants, initiatives to enhance early awareness, college preparation, and retention of at-risk students. At USA Funds, we take seriously our nonprofit and statutory mission to enhance post-secondary access and success, and we look forward to working with all of you for that. Thank you. focused on this report, let me tell you a little bit more about it. With the goal of creating a useful informational tool for California higher education decision makers, and to use this tool to accelerate Latino student success in higher education, Excelencia in Education recruited the Tomas Rivera Policy Institute, PRPI, and the California Policy Research Center, CPRC, to join us as together we examined and distilled three areas of critical information. Pertinent research on the topic, student success, Latino student achievement, issues pertinent to this question, research produced over the last six to eight years. Current status of Latino educational distilled and ready for the, the critical element for the excitement that the recommendations have generated, direct input from California higher education decision makers done through one-on-one -on -one group discussions, but the objective was, in these discussions, what is doable? What can you do now? Not tomorrow, not with some appropriation, but what can you do this moment? The results are California policy options to accelerate Latino student success in higher education, which was released in December of 2006. And as part of our project, we are holding briefings in California, 
and you are participating in the first of the briefings that we will hold here in Washington, D.C. At this point, I would like to introduce the uh, <coughs> briefs author, the panel that will respond. I want to assure you that despite our late start to fill the room and get uh, I'm a four, the mother of a four-year-old and food in your tummies, uh, <laughs> despite our late start, we will extend the uh, end of this program uh, so that it will run till 2 o'clock because the question and answer period is critical. For all of you would have to leave uh, when it was originally scheduled, feel free. For those who stay, relax because you know that the question and answer period will extend till then. <laughs> Uh, so, may, I, may I add that uh, we're videotaping it, um, so it will be up on the California Institute's website in a streaming format, uh, you know, like calinst.org, C-A-L-I-N-S-T dot O-R-G. Does anyone have to leave before the final board? Thank you. We'll have to figure out hot links to this <laughs> So let me introduce, first, Deborah Santiago who is the Vice President for Policy and Research at Excelencia in Education, has served in that role since the organization's founding. She brings to this responsibility previous experience, including as a policy analyst in the U.S. Department of Education, as Deputy Director at the White House Initiative on Educational Excellence for Hispanic Americans, and as the Vice President for Policy Analysis at the Los Angeles County Alliance for Student Achievement. Her research uh, examines accountability, higher education policy, institutional practices, and Latinos in higher education. If you've not visited our website, know that there are many useful documents that are there, including those that were referenced by uh, Vice President Muhlenberg. Following her presentation, which will be the backbone of our discussion today, are representatives of our two partnering groups. First will be Estela Zarate, Director of Educational Policy Research at the Tomas Rivera Policy Institute at the University of Southern California. <coughs> Dr. Zarate's recent research has explored college access issues among Latinos, including access to college prep curriculum, financial information, and uh, among underrepresented students. And following her will be Andres Jimenez, the Director of the California Policy Research Center of the University of California Office of the President. CPRC is a University of California system-wide program that applies independent, nonpartisan scholarly, scholarly research expertise to public policy issues. Mr. Jimenez has researched and written about society and politics in the United States and Mexico, U.S. race relations and ethnic relations, U.S. immigration policy, and U.S. Latin American relations. We share this information with you because the focus right now is the brief, the ongoing work, when we get back to our desks, is what do we do with this information? And we hope that you will know that all of us stand ready to work with you. I'll turn things over to Dr. Santiago. Short, I gotta bring this down a little bit. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. see. Now that you've eaten, we've gotta make sure that you're energized for that. I'll try to talk 15 minutes. I know it's, it was cold in here when we started. And I think with all this stuff, it's going to get a little bit warm. So hopefully we'll, we'll share enough with you to generate some questions. Uh, but feel free at any point, uh, after I present, <laughs> to, uh, to ask questions and know that you can follow up with us. We're here in DC. And this is, uh, this is what we care about. So whenever we can be of help to you, please let us do that. Um, we're here to talk about California policy options and Latino student success in California. I think a lot of what we found in California is applicable elsewhere. And I hope that those of you that are in California can very much take it to heart. And those that are not in California can see the applicability of the states that you're working in, or even at a national landscape. As Terry shared, there are things that we can do at the national level as well. So I'm going to try to be brief, but let me tell you, I am a research nerd, and I love numbers, so I'm going to share a couple with you. Um, but try not to share too much, because the focus really is on the action and what you can do. And, you know, this really stemmed in the conversations we had with legislators in California. They said there's so much good research out here, you know, the 60-page piece on X and Y and Z. But often the recommendations come and they say, increase access to higher education. Give more money to pay for college. And those are wonderful goals, but they're not as easy to be actionable items that you can lift and put into a policy, excuse me, into a, a bill right, that you want to propose. So part of our strategy here was to take all the good work that's gone in California and rather than reinventing the wheel with my own you know, crunching of numbers, try to synthesize it in a way that we could then get to the action part. 
So what you see in this publication, I mean, it's got three pages of references. And this is good work that other people have done. And we try to synthesize it in about two pages. So we have more references than we actually do the substance. But we tried to hit it home because we kept noticing that the research was saying the same thing time and time again. And yet, we weren't really doing things con concretely about it. So this is what I kind of narrowed down a lot of that research saying. And I think this will probably resonate with you who work in this area. There, there are basically five converging trends that are happening today. And probably started a little bit before today, but we're in here in the now, right? So we know that the economic competitiveness of our country and in California requires more knowledge workers, right? And to be a knowledge worker requires a degree of some sort. And we know in California and in the U.S. that the Latino population is the largest growing population, second largest, you know, ethnic group, but the fastest growing. And we know that Latino educational attainment levels are lower than other groups. But we also know that there are more low-income first-generation students, of which many are Latino, that are getting ready and trying to prepare to go to college. So these trends are not uh, doomsday predictions, but in our minds, create an opportunity for action. Because they are the youngest population, and they are growing, we have opportunities with the students today, but also those that are coming up. So that's, I thought, that, that's the synthesis of all the research that you've got there, and you've got all the references that you want to go there. It's trying to be quick, right? But then I have to give you a couple numbers. So that was my synthesis, that was my, I did this kind of number thing. Five trends, three goals, 17 recommendations. If you take that away, you have the synthesis of my entire presentation. <laughs> so here's a couple of things that we know. And again, I'll try to be brief, but I want to I take a step back and give you a little bit more of that context. So we know that in California, Latinos are going to be over a third of the workforce by 2020. That's not too far away. 38%. It's 40% of the workforce is going to be Latino. Okay? That's really important. Keep that in mind. And I'd like you to take a look. Can you see it up here? The, uh, the yellow. Oh, look. He gave me this cool thing. See this thing? This is <laughs> educational attainment for Latinos. And when you take a look, elementary, high school, high school graduates, some college, and a baccalaureate degree or more, well, you see that funnel effect, right? And that's what, this is at the national level. It's very similar to what we see in California and lots of other states. But I, I felt I had to share it because it's such a powerful graphic to illustrate what we're talking about. Okay. Here's the other thing, one of the other trends that we were talking about. Latinos have lower educational attainment. When I looked in California, again, in California, the country overall, 25 and over 12% of Latinos have a baccalaureate year more. 12%. When we looked in California, 9% of Latinos, 25 and over, have a baccalaureate year more. Now, when we're talking about this convergence of trends, the need for knowledge workers, for economic competitiveness, for the demographic growth that we're seeing in California and places. This is an important number for us to address. We have to do better. We have to find a way to act, not just talk about it. So many conversations about Latinos is all focused on demographics. And, you know, we're coming, we're coming, we're here. You know, I, I tease, uh, and I tell people this time, you know, the mantra of the 60s is we shall overcome. And the mantra for Latinos in the 21st century is we shall overwhelm. <laughs> and if this room is any indication, we're well on our way. <laughs> um, so but it is important that you take a note that 31% of all, and that's pretty good. And that's close to the national average in California. It's, it's close to the national average. But only 9% of Latinos. That's something that we really have to address. Here you have the other, this is, I think this is my last slide, but I had to get the numbers in there. And, you know, we look at the young adults in California. Again, this is California. They're less likely to be enrolled in higher education. 22% compared to 43 white, 60% of Asian Pacific Islanders, 32% of African Americans. We need to increase all those numbers, don't get me wrong. But certainly, we have to do a better job of getting like, you know, young adults to enroll in college. And I'm not even bifurcating you know, community colleges, four year, I'm not even doing that with these numbers. So that would even further exacerbate it. We're looking, if baccalaureate degrees are goal, then we really have a lot more work to do. So that's kind of the, the quick overview of the condition, and that's about you know, half the publication that you get there. The other half is really focused on, so what can we do? Are there things out there? And I don't know that these are necessarily rocket science, but I think it does require a certain level of commitment 
and uh, awareness and a focus on the students we're trying to serve. Not necessarily to the exclusion of other students, but with a knowledge base of those that we must serve as well. So what I try to do is focus on what we saw as three primary goals for college in California. And we wanted to posit this not as issue of college access. So many people we talk to in California and elsewhere, you know, the goal is access to college. Because once they get in, it's up to them. They just say, que vaya con Dios, let them go with God, they'll do the good thing. But at the end of the day, for our competitive workforce, it takes more than just getting them in. We've got to get them out. They got to, I mean, I mean that, by that I mean a degree. I'm going to get them out, I'm push them out. I don't mean it that way. They have to get a degree. That's, that's absolutely critical. So what we try to posit in this piece is that the goal for policy has to be more than access. It has to be success. And now, access, academic preparation, all those persistence, retention efforts, those are some components of success. But if we don't aim at the right goal, then it's going to make our activities uh, much more limited and our overall success a lot more limited. So that's kind of one of the things we want to posit. A lot of uh, the legislators in California were talking about access, making college more affordable. That's critical. And don't get me wrong, that's what we have here is our three goals for college success. But it's not the only one. So we say you need to provide information to prepare for college. And this is our approach at academic preparation. And there's a whole bunch to unpack out of all these goals. But this is our way to kind of synthesize what we were talking about. Make college affordable and increase the degree attainment of all Californians. Absolutely critical. So if these are our goals as a policy entity in a state that has such needs, what do we do? I think I did. Yeah. See? Five minutes. What do we do? We got there. Um, and in the brief, you see 17 policy recommendations. I'm not going to go through all of them because I think that um, that's your homework. And hopefully it will inspire you for additional ideas about what's possible. Because what you see in this document is our effort in talking to legislators, uh, institutional leaders, uh, students, to try and glean what was doable. Not to be exhaustive, but to capture diverse areas and a focus to get towards action. And sometimes that means baby steps. And sometimes it means just moving forward. Sometimes it's just awareness. But our thought was we, got, we have to start somewhere, so let's start with these kinds of things. We try to focus on a wide range of options. We try to focus on concrete and actionable stuff based on data, um, which we think is important. So here's, here's what we try to do. Here's my policy parameters for those of you who are policy folks who appreciate what we're talking about here. We try to focus on actionable items that were in three main areas, okay? We wanted to use existing structures in new ways. A lot of what we heard from legislators is, you know, uh, don't come to us with something that's going to cost us millions and billions of dollars, per se. Because we get that all the time. To say that we need to increase support for higher education is a lofty goal, but you know, how do I write that into a bill? And how much is enough? And all those great questions. So we want to focus on what are we doing currently with our resources? And are there ways that we can redeploy them in new ways to get to this aim of accelerating Latino student success. So let me give you two examples of, of some of the recommendations we have in the, in the publication. One of the things that uh, we tried to take a look at was this idea of prepare, giving information so parents and students can prepare for college and prepare for early. So I was thinking to myself, how early? Well, how about providing information to parents at maternity boards about preparing and paying for college? You have a captive audience. We know from the data. We know, you know, parents want the best for their children, even then, but you know, they're, they're ready for it. They get lots of other material, so why not? And we noticed when I did the analysis, you know, over 50% of new births in the state of California are two Latino mothers. Over 50%. So again, not to exclude anyone, but if half of all new uh, children in, in the state of California are Latino, if you get information about preparing and paying for college at maternity wards with that beautiful gift basket of diapers and all that stuff, you know, the likelihood is that you're, you're more likely to get into their hands and they're more likely to think about it. Because we need them to start thinking about it, if not before the child is born, then as soon as they're born, right? And a lot of what we know is that there is an information gap for Latinos who, if they weren't educated in this country or don't have a higher education degree, they don't even know how to navigate what is a very complex system. And I have a PhD, and I, find, and I work in higher ed, and I find it complicated. So imagine what these parents have to go through. But we don't mean to stop it there. We mean start it there. 
And so another idea we have is create an elective course at middle school. Let's not wait until high school. I do a lot of financial aid workshops with students as seniors. And you know, it's February. Um, half so is already due. You know, so uh, if we can get them early, because this is, we know that middle school research tells us this is a pivotal time for students to think about where they're going to go in the future. Why not have elective course? We have it for driver's ed, right? Because we want everybody to know the right laws because they're going to be behind a wheel. Well, why don't we do that for our kids? In middle school, it's an elective, but it starts early, and it's not just two hours. And my colleague here will talk about some of the work that TRPI is doing in that very sense, in that very way. To try and get them early and make sure it's consistent information. Um, so the, the first idea is using existing structures. The other is then invent investing funds in new ways. Again, to focus on success, not to, not to negate access, but to focus on success. So we had a couple of ideas there, too. Um, and one is to create this idea of, uh, called it the Golden State Scholars. So how many of you have heard, uh, you know, in Indiana, the 21st Century Scholars? Okay, good. Well, that's a pretty interesting idea. And California does a really good job. They have Cal Grants already, you know, so it's not like there aren't mechanisms in place. We thought we could do something more creative than that. And so not to do away with Cal Grants, but let's come up with something that's creative that targets, for example, low-income areas and does outreach for the universities to reach out to students who have great need and find ways to support them and support them early on. And you know, there's a lot more detail to this, and I'm not going to go into tons of it. But so we try to think of creative ways, again, with Cal Grants and other materials to make sure that there is an emphasis on students and their ability to go. The other idea we have is why don't we create incentives for continuous enrollment attainment? Again, these are not rocket science, but what we try to do is operationalize it, find ways to operationalize it. We know, for example, community colleges that their funding is predicated on headcount. It's not predicated on how many you graduate, it's predicated on how many you enroll. So, you know, every semester, conceptually, you can enroll a new head. Right? It doesn't have to be the same one. So I provide incentives on the other end. And I don't mean penalize institutions, I mean incentives on the other end. So that there is some financial support for the students that they graduate. And I don't mean to simply, let's take the graduation rate and get money, because we have lots of issues with graduation rates. They're good, but they're time bound, and for Latino students, they're not as relevant. It might take them six years to get a, a two-year degree, but they persist. And we don't want to penalize institutions who educate those students, because they do persist. But can we find a way to incentivize the institution? That's first. Second of all, can we incentivize the students themselves to do it? Uh, one of the things that we found is that just giving a tuition credit to students, and, and this is variable, but it's some of the things I saw, 150 bucks, 200 bucks, tuition credit to maintain continuously enrolled. You don't stop out or drop out and come back in. That something as small as that can make a difference for students. Not a lot. I mean, there, another example I saw was people were giving uh, for uh, they thought the uh, bookstore, credit right, for the bookstore that you maintain continuously enrolled. Those are some ways that you can provide incentives for students to get them to remain continuously enrolled. Again, not rocket science, but when we talk to students and others, we say, "Wow, this wouldn't. This is not that hard if we are committed to doing it." The third area is using existing data and practices to bring it to scale. Because there are things that are working. And we're not presuming that we're starting from scratch. And you know, there could be a laundry list of that. Excellency, we're trying to do some work called Examples of Excellency, try and catalog the things that are working in institutions across the country. But that's, a, that's another presentation. Um, but what we found is that you know, they're, they're, all of the, the three public systems in California are all doing things. They are, and that's to be commended. But one of the examples we saw is that they're not very well coordinated. What Cal State system does is not necessarily, in fact, often not uh, in any way related to what the California Community College system is doing. And sometimes it's duplicative, and sometimes it's uh, they talk past each other. And you know, what a phenomenal idea to get the three system heads to talk to each other and come up with a coordinated plan. Maybe we can make better use of our limited resources. <laughs> uh, can I get the Nobel Prize for that one? Sorry. Right, right. <laughs> right. Well, that's all another issue. Yeah. You got your five minutes in there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and another thing that we know is critical is Latinos 
predominantly not just in California, but certainly in California, the majority of us are enrolled in community colleges. That's great because it provides powerful access, but we're not getting through. We're not getting the baccalaureate degree. Often we're not going on to the four-year institution at all. So we need to do a better job of increasing transfer rates. And we offer some suggestions of ways that might happen. Again, trying to incent provide incentives for that to happen, uh, but acknowledging that certainly it's not easy. We work with institutions as well, and they tell us all the time, Articul we have articulation agreements, and would that that would make things easy. That's not necessarily the case, especially when a student has to navigate that whole transfer process. That's never fun. So we offer some suggestions for that as well. Um, I think well with my time. Uh, I'm sorry, I mean, we really tried to synthesize this. I hope that we stimulated maybe some ideas or questions that you might have about this. Because our focus really is on getting elected officials to find ways to act within the crews of their responsibility. A lot of the ideas we have are really focused uh, because our audience at the time were uh, legislators in California, institutional leaders, and uh, community-based leaders overall to act to focus, to acknowledge, and to go forward. But I think that, as Terry mentioned, there are some things that we can do at the national level. And we, uh, as an organization, are committed to doing that. And I'm happy to have conversations with you about that at another time. But I want to cede the floor to my colleagues so that they can share what they're doing and their impressions of the piece. Um, and let you know that this is our website, and we have lots of information that we hope will be helpful to you as you go forward in your efforts. Thank you very much. some of the perspectives uh, uh, in terms of the portfolio at the Tomas Rivera Policy Institute by way of response and following her for Andres to report very specifically on the immediate reaction by state legislators in California and some of the um, higher educational system uh, individuals and then if he wishes, and I'm sure you will, the pertinence to some of the work that the CPRC will be doing. Yes, Ella? Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, what I want to talk about today is give you examples of how it is that we have bridged what we know about research and um, applied that to some actual programs that uh, operate uh, out of TRP. Um, first of all, there's two programs I'd like to describe. Uh, Kids to College is a program that is funded by the Sally Mae Foundation. And it's a six-week curriculum for middle school students um, at about five different school districts, uh, targeted 2,500 students total. And it's uh, an introduction to information about college, about careers, about um, career expectations. And it culminates in a campus visit at two different, at either of two different Cal State um, universities. And uh, so it's a partnership between the funder, Sally May, TRPI, who runs and coordinates the program, and the Cal State system, which um, appoints uh, liaisons to work with us on for this program. And then the school districts who uh, where teachers volunteer and are able to implement this curriculum in their classrooms. Um, the second program is what we have, it's called College Knowledge Campaign. And specifically, I'm going to speak about the parental component of it. And what we did with that is Honda funded um, stipends for us to train parents around um, just at Los Angeles County at the school districts. Uh, parents who were affiliated with MALDEF's uh, National Parent Support Program. And again, we developed a curriculum for them to use to present to fellow parents at different schools on either college nights or different kinds of parent meetings that were at school. And these parents had this is a PowerPoint, a DVD presentation, as well as handouts that given everything as a package and trained on how to do these presentations and they're able to do those as often as they want. They receive a stipend for every presentation they do and um, in schools where their children go to or where they have friends, etc. So what these two programs answer to is the Kids to College, a middle school program, is the answer to research that has demonstrated that intervention um, is needed in the earlier years. Um, a high school where most students have been tracked to either an academic or sometimes a vocational uh, academic course track. 
So it's important that we address those needs earlier on. So that program specifically was targeted for that finding. Um, the college knowledge, the parent college knowledge campaign uh, was a response to our previous research that demonstrated how very few parents, how very few Latino parents know about what it takes to go to college and the financing of college education. Um, you know, the last research that I have out of California, this is for youth, um, only one in five of students surveyed mentioned loans as a possible source of financial aid. So that kind of um, example illustrates the college information gap that exists for many youth. Uh, so that, that's what that specifically targeted. Um, so those are, those, that's a description of the program. <coughs> the strengths are that the kids to college is an early intervention. It's great. Um, kids are ready to begin talking about college earlier than that if you really wanted to do that. Um, it's also not targeted. Uh, and there's positive and negatives to that. I know there's a lot of not-for-profit programs out there that target certain students, either students that are on the cusp or students that are already on their way to college or completely at risk students, etc. But what we do is, um, it's actually a pretty random selection. For kids to college, the teachers are the ones that volunteer to um, implement the curriculum in their classroom. And for the parental college knowledge campaign, it's parents go if they want. There isn't, um, we're not targeting uh, parents of ESLs, the students only, or any of that. So um, in a way, there's, uh, you know, it, it lessens the burden of defining who it is that receives the help. Um, and it also, when I think about the evaluation component, it actually provides a very good um, tool to, to study. Um, it's, so it's accessible to everyone, uh, for the most part. Um, all of these programs are replicable uh, in, in fairly low cost, um, so that's also very, a very positive aspect of these programs. Um, what I feel is the most important uh, contribution of these programs is that it lets parents and teachers be agents of change. Um, so that it's not uh, academic counselors working with students and placing the role of institutional change from the outside counselor or the outside not-for-profit organization that comes in to operate the program. But rather, it, it empowers or gives tools to um, players in those institutions and schools to implement some of these changes and some of this language about college within their schools. And I think they're much more, they're better at it than if I were to go from the outside and talk about this. Um, limitations, and this is a very frank discussion, um, and this not only applies to these two programs, but a lot of what I observe about which programs that are out there. Why are we targeting parents? Well, the basic assumption is that we know that parents don't know a lot about college, and we know there's some sort of relationship between parents that don't know about college and students not going to college. The big assumption that we make is that giving parents information about FAFSA actually means something. We don't know. And I think that's a huge limitation of a lot of parent campaigns that are out there, is that we assume that providing information actually changes behavior or actually um, allows for institutional change when the information is only given at the individual level. And that's a big assumption that I think is a weakness of a lot of programs. Um, how, and the other, the other, um, this is not, this is a weakness and a strength. And it's interesting, these two programs are run out of GRPI. And one has this component and one doesn't. And that's the evaluation. Uh, very few programs out there incorporate evaluations into, into writing that. And it really, in the ideal world, you want 15% of the operating budget to be allocated to evaluation. That's the only way that you can understand whether your program is effective or not. Now, kids to college, we have an evaluation component. It's a pre and post treatment survey. Um, the parent knowledge, college knowledge campaign, we don't. Um, and you know, this is this is this is a, a limitation of the program. And what drives this is the funders. So I know that there's some funders here, and it's so important to be able to allocate that to programs because that. Um, that can really drive um, the change in the, and, and the refining of the program. So the Kids to College program, we have a pre and post uh, treatment survey. 
And this year we were able to alter the curriculum based on some information that we had on how to structure the curriculum so that students could learn a little bit better about what it is that we really want them to achieve. Now, the problem with evaluations is that um, you, one never, oftentimes there's confusion between short-term and long-term goals of a program. Um, and it's very important to align the organizations or the program's mission to the evaluation. So, for example, in both of these programs, they're corporate funders, and their interest is in breach. That's often how a funder sometimes evaluates success, is how many people were targeted, how many uh, people were reached. If one examines the mission statement of the program, nowhere does it mention that the target is to reach as many parents or as many students as possible. So there's, so there, and I see this frequently over and over again in every program that comes to me to evaluate. And the first thing that I say is we need to sit down together and talk about how the evaluation is going to match the mission goals. And that, that's often very, you know, some people walk away from such an evaluation because it does ask that sometimes the mission be changed if you want the evaluation to actually measure the objectives of the program. Um, so that's something that, um, it's a frank discussion about, about limitations of programs, and I know there's program coordinators here, so it's important to know that. Um, the only last limitation that I want to say that I mentioned earlier is there's often a confusion when one reads research, and there's a correlation that establishes a relationship between one thing and, the, and another, but we don't know if the causation is actually there. And that's often the case with parent work, is that we know that parental involvement, blah, 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 there's some relationship to academic achievement, but we don't understand the causation. And in fact, here's an example of how this is so complicated. If I had a nickel for every time that I heard that if we increase parental expectations about academic achievement, academic achievement will increase. It's just a relationship that exists out there. Nobody understands the direction of it. Um, until recently, on a 15-year longitudinal study that we worked on, we found out that actually the relationship is the other way around. Academic achievement predicts parental expectations, and there's a year lag. And it's so it's it often it goes, it's counterintuitive to I think what a lot of us operate our programs under, but it's also very logical if you think about parents, and they are logical most of the time. But that's an example of how to <laughs> how to think about outreach programs. Andres Jimenez, uh, Director of California Policy Research Center, which as Sunny dimension, uh, it has its mission to make available to the state's policymakers, including uh, members of the California Congressional Delegation, and more broadly in terms of UC's public service mission to any member of Congress, uh, the expertise of the UC system uh, on, a, on an independent uh, basis. So uh, we invite you to come to us on these and other issues that you, uh, of uh, federal policy importance. I do actually want to answer a little, a, another question related to FAFSA here, which is something that came up in the context of the recommendation on the Golden State Scholars Program, which is related to the 21st uh, Century Scholarship Program in, in Indiana. Uh, there was just a court ruling last week, in fact, where a student who did not was not willing to supply their parents' social security uh, information because of the immigration status of the parents, uh, and had gone to court, uh, had won their case, and in in that uh, the the administrative office of the 21st Century Scholarship Program was requesting the student provide the social security number of the parents, and in fact the court ruling in Indiana said that it was not a requirement for the student to submit the parents' social security number. We have often the case of students who are born in the United States of immigrant parents or students who are permanent legal residents and have immigrant parents, one of whom may not uh, yet have a legal immigration status. And definitely the FAFSA barrier is a major barrier when you have parents who are not documented. So there's another layer to this whole FAFSA issue uh, for those of us who are concerned about uh, college access and retention. Let me say very briefly that what we've done uh, since the report was issued in uh, early December uh, was that uh, I, working in close collaboration with Excellencia, have presented the report to the 26 members uh, of the Latino Legislative Caucus in California. 
um, as well as to their staffs at a staff retreat. And this report was very well received. Uh, indeed, uh, the March retreat of the Latino Legislative Caucus that will be held in San Diego County at the uh, Verona uh, 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 Reservation, um, uh, Casino Reservation in San Diego County on March 23rd and 24th is going to have it as its sole focus education policy. And, and the recommendations that came up with this report are going to be considered at that meeting. In addition, this last weekend, the, uh, the uh, National Association of Latino Elected and Appointed Officials held the Leadership Institute on Education Policy Issues, at which there were more, more than 85 attendees, primarily uh, uh, members of school boards and members of community college trustees, who reacted very positively to this report. And they want to be able to plug into the efforts of the Latino Legislative Caucus. We've also presented this material uh, ourselves through our office to three regions of the University of California who are very directly involved in a current initiative by the regions uh, on diversity within the University of California. It's called the Study Group on Diversity. And it was uh, generated as a result of a resolution that was adopted by uh, 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 Regent Frederick Reese, who was appointed by Arnold Schwarzenegger, um, and a student regent, Maria Ledesma, who put forward uh, a request that both the, the regions both uh, conduct a study of the effects of Proposition 209 on, the, on student diversity and campus climate, as well as conduct a study group on diversity. And as part of the study group work on diversity, we shared the results of this report. So we've had a, an opportunity to communicate the results of, and findings of this report to uh, uh, and its recommendations to a number of key policy publics in, in, uh, in California. And we hope that they will communicate back to those in federal government to talk about issues where uh, the federal decision making can, can help support the types of recommendations that are made in the report. And finally, let me say that uh, Excellency itself has been in contact with the CSU Chancellor's Office about implementation of some of the recommendations in the report. So we're pretty actively doing follow-up to these recommendations, working with key California policymakers. Um, and finally, let me say that, uh, oh, actually, before I get to my final point, Governor um, <laughs> Schwarzenegger, um, in his budget, and his wisdom, and his office, uh, have eliminated academic preparation uh, and outreach from this year's budget. It's the annual dance. The governors always eliminate the, the prep, academic preparation budget. And in response, the UC Regents, the California uh, trustee, uh, CSU trustees, the California the C the California State University Chancellor, the UC President, have all said they will go back to the legislature and ask them to replace that money, put that money back into the state budget. Unfortunately, this part of the UC budget is, and CSU budget are not protected with the partnership and compact that, that the leadership has with the governor's office. Uh, and we're hoping to work with uh, people like Frederick Reese and, and the uh, Republican appointees, uh, the, the Schwarzenegger appointees to the regents to make the case to the governor that academic preparation and outreach is very critical. Um, and it makes no sense that every year we do this dance where the governor eliminates it from the budget and then the legislature comes back and puts it back in and then, there's, and then they have to take money away from something else in order to be able to pay for it. It just doesn't make sense not to put it in the budget from the very beginning. Okay, uh, and I believe that the governor is sympathetic to this, but there, there are tensions within uh, his office about whether or not this is uh, investment in academic preparation and outreach really results in anything concrete, uh, except for maybe the MESA program. Um, finally, let me say that we received a planning grant from the William and Flora Hewlett Foundation to conduct as part of our technical assistance efforts at the California Policy Research Center a, an initiative called the University of California Program on Opportunity and Equity. And you can find our website at the Excellencia website um, as a link. Uh, and this UCPOE um, has as its, uh, among its goals to foster technical assistance in five policy areas, education, health, affordable housing, small business development, and civic participation, with education being about one third of the project. So we look forward as part of that effort to working with you and working with others in Sacramento and across California to implement these recommendations and related ones. Uh, thank you very much. Any questions, comments? So bold over.
Hi, Evan. Yes. Hello, Danielle. Hello. My name is Danielle Gonzalez. I'm from Pre-K now. I have both a request and a question. Please. The request being in your report, you refer often to K-16, K-12, um, in terms of commissions and stuff. The request being that you consider P-16, P-12, P-20. Uh, to reflect Maybe the importance of the early things. years. Yeah, good. Uh, my question, you refer in your report to how students are able to transfer from two-year uh, programs to four-year programs. In terms of early education, a lot of um, early education teachers in California are actually required to have two-year degrees. Um, and when they want to go back to get a four-year degree, a lot of the higher institutions aren't recognizing the coursework or the credits that they took at the two-year institution. <laughs> So in addition to dealing with uh, the issue of transferring, what can, what can be done in terms of articulation and making sure that those four-year degree programs recognize the coursework of the two-year degree program? Yeah, it's, it's a good question. Um, and, and complex, because obviously you're dealing with that institutional practice and institutional policies. Um, I mean, you know, so what we've, we've, we've seen happen in places like Texas and others, so that's, you know, try, try to make an example that, that can be relevant, uh, is a real push in the state legislature to uh, require that public institutions, over which they have more control, obviously, because of funding, uh, accept that, accept these sorts of degrees and accept the credits from public to your institutions towards the four year. We're finding some interesting changes, though, because um, while we see massive demographic growth, there are some places that actually have seen decreases in enrollment. And this is even in LA and other places. So it's not, we're just seeing that. And one of the challenges they're facing then of these four year institutions is reaching back to students at community colleges and increasing their enrollment more aggressively, targeting and being aware they exist as potential students than they have historically done. And part of that's a mindset because so many four year institutions want to home grow, and we can totally appreciate what that is. But a lot of our students are not there. So we've seen some examples in Texas where, and even that's not working all that well, but um, it's on the books, and maybe that's a start, but I think that's a challenge we all are facing, so. Sir, pardon me. Carlos Rodriguez, AIR. Observation and a question. I heard recently the Lieutenant Governor of Texas uh, comment on the loan forgiveness program in Texas. It's a loan forgiveness for college, a complete college education for folks, for students who major in education. Totally underutilized completely underutilized. A free ticket to college, it's a loan program, but it's, it will be forgiven. I don't know if it's an informational issue. I think the points you raised about information are very telling questions. Um, I don't know if it's an information issue. So there's, it prompts me to say we need loan forgiveness in other areas, especially STEM or other career fields, but there needs to be an information issue. The other, as I read through the uh, recommendations, I'd like the panel to comment on it. The observation is this. If you look at the Caucasian population, why does the Caucasian population have such success with post-secondary attainment? Primarily, I would observe, it's because these are embedded behaviors from parents and generations. So white parents and kids who are in white families, their parents, if they're in college, they know how to negotiate the system. All of those expectations, all of those how to do behaviors, how to handle college, are not something that's common knowledge among our people, about our people, about the Latino population, or the black population either. So in terms of your policy recommendations, I would urge you to put a lot of clout behind retention. And I'm convinced that if we could, if we could stop attrition, at the undergraduate level in particular, by at least 50%, if we could stop half the kids, half the students, I should say, excuse me, from dropping out, even if it's a six-year or seven-year program, if we could stop half from dropping out, we would get the middle-class penetration that is necessary to start changing this, you know, sort of a social model, social change model, so we get this middle-class um, evolution or sort of rotation cycle of going to college, which is a more expected norm that we see in the other population. So I urge you to. Thank you. Um, two comments there. So let me make sure I remember the one about loans. We've, we've done some work on that How Latinos Pay for College, and we're doing a follow up because we do see that um, Latinos are less likely to take out loans. And it's for a plethora of reasons. 
And let me just say, um, it's not cultural. We get that all the time. Well, for cultural reasons, they don't want to take out loans. Well, you know, um, if you think about it, you know, if they have any experience with loans at all, it's a car note or a mortgage. And you have to start paying those right away, right? So you've got a very intricate and involved loan system, some subsidized and subsidized, and try to understand all of that. Um, it's very complicated. Um, so, and for many people, there's that fear that what happens if I drop out? Then I have to start repaying that. I'd rather pay as I go. I'd rather deal with what I can afford with a sticker price. And that's a continual challenge. So I do think that part of it is information, and part of it is the knowledge base. I mean, we make choices about going part-time and going to our local community college because it's what we can afford and we continue to work and support our family and do other things. Are those bad choices? I couldn't, I couldn't say that they're bad. Uh, but we know research tells us that if you don't go full-time and you don't go to an institution that has uh, support services, that your likelihood of completing a baccalaureate degree decreases exponentially. We know that. But when we're talking to, you know, 16, 17-year-olds, they don't know that. They don't know what the research tells them about these things. They're trying to have it all. And so our challenge as an organization, I think those of you out there, is to make sure that we are more clear about the options available. And I would say it's not just students. I can't tell you many institutions we've talked to that actively and aggressively uh, tell students not to take out student loans. It's not just the students. In fact, there are some institutions that don't even participate in the loan programs. And part of it you could say, well, it's default rates. They don't want to get into issues where students default and then they're in problems for getting Pell Grants. So they don't offer it. That could be part of it. And they've said that, you know, behind closed doors. Um, but that's part of it, but also that they don't, they feel like they're being supportive of their students because they know students will take out loans and go buy a car or do something other than pay for their tuition. So they're being good stewards of the child's education. So there's a lot of stuff embedded there that we need to address. Um, in some of the research we had on things to pay for college, and I'll end with this one, um, on the loan piece at least, we found that if, especially Mexican Americans, because we cut this by subgroup, if Mexican American students went to four-year institutions, they would actually, at the end of the day, pay less than many that go to community colleges. Because of their income level, and I'm sorry, if they go to four-year colleges and go full-time, I apologize. Yes, if they go to four-year colleges and go full-time. And it's because of the low, if you look at the income level of many, especially Mexican Americans, it's pretty low. And they'd be eligible for a lot. But they don't go. We choose on sticker price, not so much on what the financial aid price. We don't wait for that in making our college choices. And that has serious implications. If we could just get that message out, I think it could make a major difference. Because we could get more of them through. So there are lots of creative ways that we can do that. Target, a lot of it for us is based on information. And it's hard because higher ed is <coughs> continually changing. You think you got it figured out. And I know every time in my every process I went through for my undergrad, my master's, and my PhD, it was different every single time, and I was so grateful I had an education. The, the second point I would make uh, that you mentioned about my students, I mean, you know, first generation college goers, and many of them are white as well, have the lack of the kitchen table conversation, which is, I think, a kind of simplistic way of saying what you're talking about. They don't know the options that are available. They don't know the many things that they can do. And there's a role for us to play in that. Um, in the recommendations, and I think I mentioned this, one idea was to encourage continuous enrollment as a way of keeping students in so they don't stop out so they're more likely to complete. That's not, uh, we're not suggesting that in a vacuum. That's the only thing that you do. We also talked about supporting existing programs that make a difference, like when the, you know, and we offer a couple of them in there. Because I think you are right. If our focus is on success and not just access, we've got to make sure that we're looking at more than just getting them in the door. And it's great if we can get them prepared, all the better. That's awesome. It's wonderful. It's much needed. But we often find that there are lots of issues when students get in. And it's not as simple as just getting prepared. You get students that choose to leave institutions that uh, they didn't know what they were getting in for. And they, or they don't feel the support that they need. Or lots of different reasons that are involved there. Um, and we could talk about this for much longer. But Deborah, just very quickly, yeah, uh, uh, on the financial aid issue, 
we've had a problem with the Cal Grant program in, in the sense that a number of students have not applied who are eligible. And clearly Mexican American students would qualify for the income-based Cal Grant program and they're simply not applying. Now this gets back to the instrumental knowledge question, I think, because a lot of folks just don't know what this thing is called the Cal Grant. Free money, actually, to go to school, which is, which is a, a, a very important. But so we have to find ways of getting this instrumental knowledge in the hands of people who have it. And of course, many of uh, the other issue related to that is Patricia Gandara did a study of SAT takers who were Mexican Americans. That the average of uh, parental education level of Mexican Americans taking the SAT, which is already an elite group within the, the Mexican American population, was something like eighth grade, compared to the Asian American Pacific Islanders, that was something like second two years of, of post high school. In other words, the Asian Americans were up around two years of college, uh, Mexican Americans around eighth grade. So that gives us a sense of the lack of access to instrumental knowledge about college, both about financial aid and college. It's not necessarily a cultural thing in itself. It's a question of not necessarily having access to information about the U.S. higher education um, system. And so we have to do something about that. Finally, the Mexican-American families in California, of, uh, among the Mexican-American students at the University of California, the lowest uh, among the students at the University of California, the group that has the lowest family income are Mexican-Americans, somewhere around $32,000 a year in family income. In a, in a state like California with the cost of living like we have in California, which just underscores the fact that Mexican-Americans would be eligible for need-based grants. Uh, okay. Well, Somebody. I have, I have a couple of questions. Yes. Um, I'm with the Hispanic Alba. Um, Can you hear Rebecca? Okay. Um, I, Mexican immigrants, particularly Latino immigrants, particularly, are, are known that they can really uh, save money. They, spend, they, they live fairly frugally. They send a lot of money home. Mm -hmm. And um, remittances. But is there a resistance to saving money for college? Don't they expect that the government's going to pay for education? That's it. Because, um, I, that's, I, I don't think so. I tell you, one of the things we found is that um, you have to know how much you actually can save. What, what we found is when we asked students about college choices, I'm going to get around this a slightly different way. They didn't really see a major difference between their community college next door and the four-year institution. And, you know, those of us who have an education know there's intrinsic value between going to an MIT or going to a, a Los Angeles Community College. We know that, right? Because we have an education. We know there's a difference between going to MIT and that. But if you, haven't, if you don't have the parents, you have other people that can tell you these things, you don't know that there's that much of a difference. Because you went through a K-12 system that you basically didn't have any choice, right? You went to where you were assigned. Now, that's probably changing a little bit. But we're finding that choice is something that's very different. So um, if people are making decisions on sticker price and paying as you go, um, how much are they actually saving overtly for it? And how much do they think about saving for college? Well, I would posit that those who are immigrants who've come here and want the best for their children have no clue what that means. How much do you save? At what point do you know that it's enough? Um, how much do you save if you have more than one kid? Um, and I don't know that there's an expectation that somebody else is going to pay for it, because if that were the case, more of us would be going. And, yes? Well, oh, sorry. well to add some data to that observation, in our surveys, most parents think it costs 40000 a year in tuition alone to go to Cal State or UC. So that the idea of saving that much probably, yeah. Probably That's more than they make in a year. Yeah. So to save that for a year of college is just... So that's the kind of stuff you have to keep in mind when the assumption is, oh, they don't want to save, they don't want to pay, you know. I, I don't know if that's the case. I think few people move to this country because they just want to freeload. Um, I think they want opportunity for their kids. But that's, again, we can get into a political conversation about that one for quite a while. Sir? Oh, yes, I'm happy to My name is Anthony Tillman. I'm the college board here in Washington, D.C. And uh, my question is, um, how is it related to Prop 209 in California? Because I think this past year, uh, and I'm just thinking UCLA had its lowest enrollment of African American students ever, it's less than 100. And um, I'm wondering, how does, how does Prop 209 play into uh, the issue of campus climate as it relates to Latino students? Since the largest population of them are at 
community colleges, which is across the nation, and also for African American students, when they think about going on to the four-year institution, which tends to have a sense of elitism and a sense of uh, you know, what is the level of receptivity, you know, perception for them, in their minds and sense like, I'm at Santa Monica College right now. Now, if I want to go to USC, will I be received there well? If not, I'm just going to finish my AA degree and go on. Or whatever happens as a consequence. Has there been any uh, research or any kind of surveys to see how the students are responding to the campus climate at the four-year UC or Cal State system? The, there is some research, and the regions themselves have, as I mentioned, both commissioned the Office of the President to do an analysis of the effects of Prop 209 and are doing, conducting the study group that includes a piece on undergraduate students, graduate students, faculty, hires, and campus climate. So by the fall of this year, there actually is going to be a formal report issued by the regents on the effects of Proposition 209. So that's in the works right now. Now, there have been some individual scholars that have taken a look at this. And under the leadership both of the Earl Warren uh, Legal Institute uh, that, that's headed uh, by Dean Chris Edley, and then now, of course, we just have uh, the, uh, we, uh, we just have, uh, uh, I'm blanking on his name right now, Gary Orfield that moved to, to UCLA, brought the Civil Rights Project. So we're, we're going to have a lot of focus on the effects of Proposition 209 in California. But let me just say briefly, the outcome, if you look at Latino enrollments at UC, Mexican-American enrollments at UC since 1996, they took a dip, just to ask African-American enrollments. And, and then they came up to pre-1996 levels, but they have not they have not risen above pre-1996 levels. And this was after a steady up, uptick from the mid-70s up through, up through the early 90s. So basically, the increase in Latino enrollment at UC, which had somewhat taken off before Prop 209, was stopped dead in its tracks. And it went down, then frozen. So it's flat. And it's, back, it's going in the wrong direction. If the number of high school graduates are rising more Latinos, then, and you have a flat enrollment of, of Latinos that you see, then we're not, we're not doing what we need to do. And we could probably add that uh, there's also that um, where they're going within the UC system is also greatly varied. So they're not going to UCLA or Berkeley, they're going to UC Riverside, good school, you know, so I'm not denigrating any of the UCs, but you're finding them in Irvine, you're finding them in other places, you're not finding them at the UCLA's and UC Berkeley's and the, the, the flagships of those entities. UC Riverside, if I understand this, it has a very good retention and graduation program. And outreach. And, and, and outreach, and I think some of the other UC systems, from my understanding, are beginning to go there to try to model what UC Riverside is doing. Even though UC Riverside had this sense of being in the lower echelon of the UC system. By location. And, and let, me, right, right. Right. let me just say that there, there, there was a, a chilling effect of a chilling effect of Proposition 209. And I, there, were, there was a little bit too much eagerness to fully to implement it beyond what it was intended uh, to accomplish. And now there's some reassessment of the effects of Prop 209, including by committees such as the, the committee that's in charge of eligibility and admissions by the Academic Senate. And so there, there's now an understanding that some things can be done that are sensitive to national origin, race, and ethnicity. And so th this is all being revisited right now. Tim, you had a question. Uh, yeah, just uh, uh, with the Higher Education Act having uh, almost been completed last year and now being well, back up years. for be, now being back up for reauthorization, uh, is anything you wanted to underscore or highlight from your comments that kind of pertains uh, directly to the, the federal uh, the, the federal legislation that's underway or may soon again be underway? It's called a softball. <laughs> Well, the, the, the hard part is that there's so much that you'd want to cover because, I mean, there's an opportunity to kind of revisit a lot of what's currently in there. Um, when we thought we were close to done with it last year or so. Um, you know, part of what we've been focusing on here and what you see in the, in the piece itself is this focus on information. I don't want to say it's just information because it is also that commitment to success. And, I, you know, I would like, I, a lot of the programs that we see in Title IV, um, are really focused on this issue of prep and access. And that's, uh, we see a lot less in, at the federal level focus on retention and completion. And so, um, I mean, we can talk for a while if you'd like about some ideas that we have about ways you can actually improve retention and completion 
um, in ways that some of the incentives and the examples we have here, I think, are relevant at the federal level. We've seen a lot of conversation about accountability and graduation rates, for example, and accountability institutions and states overall. Um, and I'm not sure what we're going to see now uh, being posited for the Higher Education Act. But I do know that we have plenty of uh, data that tells us that time-bound graduation rates that you have and make a lot of sense at a selective institution are not as relevant or as appropriate for open admission institutions. And that's in part a general statement, but when you think about it, we can't compare all institutions and assume that um, we're getting the best use of our dollars if we uh, tie them to time-bound graduations. And for me, that's a critical issue that we're going to be seeing. Because when we look at, not part of this, but where a lot of Latino students are going, we're seeing that they're not going to institutions that have rich resources that can help them get through in a timely way, and that they have other personal circumstances, situations that mean they might need to take a little bit longer. I am perpetually amazed at how persistent these students are. I don't think I could do it. I mean, I went the traditional way, and I'm very grateful when it took breaks in between. But to take eight years to graduate with a baccalaureate degree, eight to ten years, I mean, we'd be loath to call that a failure that in all the other things in their life they're taking eight to ten years to graduate. And yet there's potential that as we look at this from a federal level, as we try to contain college costs and, and deal with this issue of accountability and making sure that we push students to get through and push institutions to help them get through, that we're, we're going to forget those kinds of things. And I don't want those students to lose that. So that's one example. For-profit institutions is another. Um, I think that, uh, I don't think that what was going on before is going to follow through now. Um, but I, I think that there's a lot we can learn from for-profit institutions that we're not paying attention to. Um, I always tell a story, you know, I got a letter in the mail from one of them, and it was in Spanish on one side and English on the other, and I'm fortunate to be bilingual, so I didn't need it in two languages. But I thought, wouldn't it be great to share that with my parents, if they didn't speak well? And the letter said four quick things. In one, one page, it said, we want you, we'll work around your schedule. We'll get you financial aid, we'll get you any aid you can get, and we'll help you get a job. You send in one letter that those four points, and it's no surprise that the Latino enrollment in for-profit institutions has increased greatly in the last 10 years. Now, the scary thing is that when we deal with issues of college costs, they pay more to go to those institutions. They pay a lot more. They take out a lot more loans. So this issue of loans gets complex because why are they taking it out here and not there? Well, one of the reasons is that when you go to a for-profit institution, they sign a promissory note. And those institutions get you as much aid as they can get you. But couldn't we learn something from our public institutions by doing something similar? So I, mean, you know, I, I don't say this to support or denigrate for-profits. I say there are things that we can learn that we're not focusing on. And that has implications for Latino students most definitely. So if they don't feel like they're uh, wanted at a UC or a public system because of affirmative action, they're not even going to try. Imagine, hear people saying, we want you. So those are just examples of some of the things that I think we're not having those dialogues of um, jockeying for position with a lot of things. Sorry, here's yeah, I, two things. One, I, I spent a lot of time on proprietary issues. So <laughs> they may want your money, a lot of them. Some of them may be good, but you know you have to be really care careful. And I think as far as marketing, yeah, they may have some, some good ideas, but I think we, you have to be able to. The other thing is that you have not mentioned, and, and, uh, and I certainly um, know of and, and have worked with the UC system, but you have not mentioned at all private colleges. And private colleges, proportionately have about the same number of students of every different uh, group. Um, you know, it, the problem is that they're smaller and smaller in number, so you don't sort of get recognize that as, as easily, but proportionately they're, they're pretty much the same, and the graduation rates are much, much, much higher. Yes. So yeah, I don't know whether you're doing any, any study or look at what, uh, what difference that is, but as a product of USC, <laughs> a private institution, because they paid my whole tuition, so I'm very grateful for that. Well, that's the yes. other thing that, that, that the private students give a lot of um, financial, support. financial support, and oftentimes the, they give need based. But the problem, this goes back to what we were saying before about what you know. I mean, I'm very fortunate that I'm fairly assertive and I navigate the system and figured that kind of stuff out. But you didn't even, it was not mentioned at 
Because we're dealing with we're dealing with we're talking to elected officials and policymakers at the state level, and they have less influence over independent institutions. But yes, there's no doubt that graduation rates, if you if we go in, are making a big difference. But I know if I had seen USC with a sticker price of forty two thousand dollars a year, um, and I didn't have the ability to navigate the system and work it and get support, I wouldn't consider that institution. And yet I know because I am a researcher. The likelihood of my completing increases exponentially if I go to a private institution. So, you know, this, this policy brief was not intended to be exhaustive and inclusive, but we try to focus on the areas, the public institutions, not because the independents are not important, but because the vast majority of our students are going to the publics. So, another policy brief could probably capture the importance of that. But we certainly recognize it. It's just hard to, in 15 minutes, how can you cover everything? So. My name is Vida Sanchez, and my colleagues and I are here from Fairfax County Public Schools out here in Virginia. I don't know if there are any other people from Virginia here, but... Um, I live there. <laughs> um, I'm interested in uh, one of the panelists is talking about uh, parental expectations and, and what the data shows uh, in correlation to um, academic achievement about um, in this case, we're talking about Hispanic uh, students. Um, in our school system, we're working on the premise that parental engagement um, will correlate, will will lead us to higher or more positive outcomes when it comes to academic achievement. So I'm, I'm just interested in whether there's data that has shows any kind of correlation between, that is our mission. I, I remember you talked about mission and uh, allowing that to the evaluation part of um, the work that we do. And I'm just interested in what does parental engagement and academic achievement, what, what does the data say about that? We actually know a lot, of, is, it, is it elementary schools no. that you and your colleagues are? Middle high school, school, middle school. Middle school. Middle school. Middle school. Middle school. Middle school. We know a lot about elementary schools and what a parent engagement means there. That means reading to them. But there's definitely a very um, strong relationship between reading to your child or the parent using literacy skills on the job and talking about that at the home and what that means to reading achievement in elementary school. At the middle school and high school level, we actually don't know much at all. Um, and I'm glad that you, I, I'm very impressed and I'm very happy that you've made the distinction between parental expectations and engagement. And because you're an educator, I know that you, you understand those differences. Um, but I, I know so many outreach programs that use all of those words interchangeably, and that's so dangerous. Um, we know very little about middle school and high school. We're doing um, a study, and I'll be glad to give you my business card, and it'll be out this summer, uh, where we interview parents in middle schools and high schools um, in three different cities in the U.S., of you know, parents. And then we interview the, the educators and administrations at the schools that are represented in our parent focus groups. And thus, we, we're, we're done with the interviews, we're doing analysis. And what we can tell right now is that parents and educators have very different expectations about what parental engagement and involvement looks like. Uh, parents see their, their engagement in their child's education as involved in their lives. And we do know from other research that Latino you know, parents for us, education does not mean just formal education. It means also um, education in the home. And it all comes together. There's just no distinction between those two different sets of practices and values. And what we know is that in their involvement, they also use that same framework. Um, and when we ask parents, how are you involved, give us examples. They're examples of being involved in their child's life. And that's very different from the way sometimes the educators that we interview, the way they define parental involvement is presence in the school. And so preliminarily, I can tell you that our recommendation is going to be that there's more alignment in what those different definitions mean. You know, I, I don't know the specifics of your program, but I would ask parents what it means to them to be involved. And th there might be something in the middle um, to be able to do. Um, an example of one of our parents, several of our parents mentioned this, and I realize this is widespread practice, was they dig through their kids' backpacks every day. 
Um, and, it's, and it's to find grades on tests and also to look for drugs. Um, and <laughs> to look for love letters. And I mean, but they really just want to know what's going on with their kids' lives. And that, you know, teenagers are no different than other teenagers. They don't want to talk about their lives in school. So I think that's, that's an example. And I think it's a very effective way of parents to be involved. They sh everyone should dig through their kids' backpacks. Um, that's an example of how they would say now. I, I want to ask. Uh, I'm Gene Chin from the American Sociological Association. Uh, there's increasing general public attention and certainly social science attention on the one variable that hasn't been mentioned here at all, and that's gender uh, of the students. Mm -hmm. question and there's a lot on, on achievement and expectations and aspirations and how things have sort of been flipped around now that you know versus 20 years ago about what you know achievements looking like for, for girls or some boys starting in elementary and ongoing through uh, to middle and high school okay. uh, do you foresee uh, as part of your research and, and in terms of any suggestions that you make uh, with programs and stuff uh, maybe this is already going on yeah actually um, you should read um, in January I had a piece come out in the Harvard at review and it was analysis of the same longitudinal study for 15 years and how there's different predictors for college enrollment for boys and girls. And for girls, actually their academic trajectories had very little to do with where they went to college and whether they went to college at all. It wasn't until the end of high school that those factors became predictive. For girls, and well for boys, everything predictive. Beginning in kindergarten, their, how, how fast they learned how to read and whether they knew how to read Spanish or English, all of that predicted in college enrollment. What was interesting was that for everyone, teachers in first grade could predict who was going to go to college and who wasn't. Um, in fact, the statistical significant differences between those that didn't go to college, those that went to a two-year, and those that went to a four-year university. In first grade, teachers rated those three different groups significantly different. Um, and that's, uh, to me, that was just, so we really want to know whether someone's going to college, you should probably ask their first group teachers. And we were doing work as well, I can share with you. Well, there, there, there's another aspect of this dimension. Of course, clearly, yeah, but the trends are that in undergraduate education, Latinas are much more highly represented in undergraduate education than Latinos. It, it evens out again at the graduate school level. But something on the order of 55% in California of the undergraduate students are women among you know, uh, 55 uh, going up of the educators. And whether the educator has instrumental knowledge of the community they're working in. Over 80% of, of California teachers are, are not Latino, not African American, they are white. And a big problem we have with teachers, particularly recently trained teachers, is their inability to engage the communities that they're from. So it's hard to engage parents when you can't communicate with them. And you don't know where they're coming from. So we have to, that's another dimension of parental engagement that we have to understand and work with. What are we doing to train our educators? And we have seen the dismantling of the bilingual, bicultural credential in California following another proposition, Prop 227. They're actually, they are not issuing B, B clad credentials anymore in California. It was through the B clad credential program that, that prospective teachers received training on how to relate to immigrant communities. So that's a big issue area that we have to address. And I, I think that we're almost out of time, but we are we have been doing some work looking at specifically Latino males. Um, not to say we don't are looking at Latinas as well, but uh, it's a phenomenon that we started seeing a couple of years ago in the data. And um, I don't think there's a lot out there that gives you robust uh, analysis. I mean, Estella just mentioned something that's actually fairly new. Um, but I think there are a lot of researchers out there that are starting to take a look at this phenomenon because it's not just Latinos, it's also African Americans that we're seeing this wide and growing disparity. And um, there are some places that are trying to do something about it. I know that the CUNY system is very engaged in an initiative to try and address this issue for their male population overall. Um, and I know that there are a couple of others as well, but I think that we're out of time. And um, I'm happy to talk to you later if you'd like, but uh, thank you all very much. what to watch for from us. The dissemination and engagement work on this report will continue through Excelencia through June. And in that discrete time frame, we will be monitoring reactions, 
you will be basically reporting out who's doing what, what's been picked up. And by June, we will, uh, if you visit our website, have available institutional leaders, policymakers who have reacted to these recommendations with action. The comment that I uh, said I would include, I will just plop it in right now. So goes California, so goes the nation. When we decided to take this one on, uh, we did so very self-consciously. Our focus is on accelerating Latino student success. We cannot, as an organization, do our work without tracking what happens in California. So on some level, there's a convenience of a, a state, of a discrete piece of geography, and a set of real individuals. Your presence here today makes you part of that group. We're particularly pleased at the kind of dialogue we got into with the question and answers, and expect to offer venue, have this action. But then more important, and perhaps novel, is, and then let's talk to each other about what happened. Because it isn't simply the program, and we launched it, and then we move on to something else. Did it work? Why did it work? And how can it work in other places? Fundamentally, the issues of accelerating students, we together will work with you to look at these practices and policies. We hope you will turn to the website as source of information, and that you will keep us in mind as your busy schedules fill up for the coming months. I want to put in one plug for an activity that we will be doing next month on Valentine's Day. On February 14th, we will be holding the Examples of Excellencia Showcase. At that time, we will invite the recipients of the 2006 Examples of Excellencia, and they will be uh, supported by two members of Congress, and the event will be held here in the Capitol. I won't tell you more so that I'll whet your appetite and you'll have to visit our website. But more than anything else, know that today is the beginning of what will be not only this year's worth of activities, but an ongoing effort. We will be around till 2 o'clock, happy to talk with you informally, and again, most importantly, thank you for making time in your busy schedule to join us today.